Democratic Visions is handmade by volunteers in Eden Prairie and Minnetonka by DFL Senate District 42. Tom Rukavina has served in the Minnesota Legislature for 23 years, representing District 5A. He hails from Virginia, where he's, which means he's a ranger. He's arguably our best known lawmaker, but wants to be the first DFL governor since Rudy Perpich, also a ranger. Okay. Can you give us just a, a little broader sense of where we are uh, statewide uh, on an economic level? Well, first of all, as you uh, accurately uh, mentioned uh, here uh, earlier, we have a $1.2 billion deficit to make up in this current biennium, which ends uh, on June 30th of next year. And uh, what the problem that we have is that we've been starving government. I actually think that this deficit is more by design uh, from when Tim Pawlenty was majority leader and uh, Steve Swiggum was speaker. Then no, no question about that. I've got to interject that. Yeah, you know, that's a political philosophy, it seems to me. And that's part. what I think is going on here. And now they've, you know, the governor's tried to say that uh, he's not raising taxes, but by cutting a number of different uh, state aids that go to school districts and local governments and counties, uh, he's basically increased my property taxes. He's doubled them in five years. And I know that anybody out there in your uh, audience that writes that uh, property tax check on May and October knows that, uh, in fact, taxes have gone up and it directly relates to what's happening at the Capitol. In 2001, things were, to use an expression, hunky-dory. What's happened since then? Well, in 1999 and 2000, we cut the income tax by about uh, a combination of those two little tweaks we made in those years. Uh, to about two billion dollars a biennium. And then in 2001, we took over, uh, we changed the Minnesota Miracle and took over school districts' uh, property taxes that had never been paid for with the general fund of the state. And that cost about two billion dollars a biennium. So if you add it up, we spent two billion dollars more than we had previously and we cut two billion dollars that used to come into the state coffers. And that's four billion dollars a biennium. And we have been in deficit to the tune of two to three to four billion dollars a biennium ever since. But in reality, if you take away what I call the Enron accounting practices that the governor's using, it's about eight billion dollars, which is almost one-fourth of our entire general fund budget. What are we going to do? How are we going to cope with that? Some of the problem is the tax collections are down and sales tax collections are down. Because the economy's the in the pits. Because the economy's in the pits. And then you've got uh, uh, other problems uh, because a lot of people are <laughs> Uh, going to uh, get social services because they're out of a job. And you also have those cuts in that new spending that I talked about that have to be looked at. So I think you have to raise some revenue. And I have said to the press uh, quite honestly, because I, that's kind of my approach, that anybody running for governor, I don't care if they're an independent, a Republican, or a Democrat, that says they can solve this problem just by cuts is either uh, a, a dummy or a liar. And, What's and your plan, Tom? One. My plan is to, first of all, go back and look at those little tweaks we made in the income tax. Uh, because income taxes are the fairest tax there are. And if we go back just to what 1999 and 2000 tax law was, we'll raise, even in this bad economy, about $1.6 billion over the biennium. Are you saying we'd roll back the rates? We'd roll the rates back to what they were. And then we have to look at uh, some of the things that we did under the Republicans uh, uh, as far as this school takeover and we did something else in 2001 called the transportation levy takeover. And of course there are places to be cut. I'm not going to argue that there aren't. I think there are, uh, I chair the Higher Education Workforce Committee. I've seen a, an exponential growth in administrators. And maybe a lot of it has to do with mandates from the feds and even mandates that we put on. Uh, say for financial aid, help, or whatever. But the fact of the matter is there's a, a lot of growth in uh, some of those uh, places where I think we need to look at to cut uh, folks. Aren't you also a proponent of a, a tax surcharge that would blink on and off as necessary? Well, that's part of the other uh, solution to, that I have. Because under El Qui, when El Qui had made a similar pledge uh, about no new taxes like Tim Pawlenty did, uh, he was faced with a DFL uh, Senate and House that dug in and said, Governor, we can't make any more cuts. And Governor Cui, being a reasonable person that he is, uh, compromised with the legislature. They were there until December 31st of that year. But they got something worked out, and it was a surcharge on income. 
And, you know, and as an ex example, if you owe a thousand bucks to the state government on your income taxes, you'd pay whatever we came up with. If it was 5%, you'd pay 50 bucks more. If it was 10, you'd pay 100. And so that's another way to bring in some dollars. That would immediately blink off as it did under that agreement reached in 1982 as soon as the economy recovers. Now, uh, I've looked at your website and you're, uh, you espouse sort of a politics of hope. Uh, do you find that a little bit difficult to do in these kind of tight, tough economic conditions that we're looking at? We have to give people hope, I think. Uh, and, and I'm hoping that this is the year that people will listen to somebody that's trying to uh, raise the issues of hope instead of trying to raise money. I'm not the millionaire in the race, and I'm not the big wheel in the race. And so, you know, my dad used to say a big wheel is somebody that got a hubcap for a head. So, you know, I'm, I'm just the common, ordinary, blue-collar worker in this race. And uh, I think that in these tough economic times, we have to have a straight shooter and somebody that's going to be out there and say, hey, I'm trying to help the common, ordinary, middle-class worker in this state and country. So tell me what the centerpieces of your campaign are going to be. Well, I'll tell you what. First of all, it's going to be like an open-door policy and, and honesty. But I've always, I, I come from a working-class neighborhood in Virginia where we were taught the importance of uh, good education and a good job. And Rudy Perpich had his campaign slogan, remember, when he came back uh, from Europe and had lost to uh, Governor Cui and came back and beat Warren Spanis in a DFL primary. It was similar to this, not quite as bad as it is today, but his theme was jobs, jobs, jobs. We have to, this state has been, had a dismal job creation record uh, for the last eight years because you can't do things on the cheap and even in business, they say you have to spend money to make money. And we haven't really been investing in this state. We have to put people back to work. That's part of the solution for collecting more tax revenue is when people are working, they're paying income taxes. So that's part of the equation. The other part of the equation is training people. Uh, our higher education and educational system in general in Minnesota used to be the pride of this state, emulated by uh, all the states around this nation uh, in Minnesota. And now what do we have? We, we are saddling our uh, students in higher education public institutions with the sixth highest debt in the nation. And they're coming out of college uh, scared about paying back that debt and scared of the fact that there's no work out there for them. We got to give them hope again in that area. And, and one of my biggest things at the Capitol, if you've been on my website, is the fact that I have harped about this for years, about the fact that we got to make things in this country. We just can't keep trading money, uh, having a service industry, having a uh, you know, uh, medical industry where nobody is actually making a livable wage job. And I've done that in my district, and, I want, and I've done that in different parts of the state, and I want to continue to do that. There's no reason why we can't be doing what I did on the Iron Range, uh, converting our electrical uh, generating plants up there that are owned by our cities into burning local products. Instead of paying uh, $12 million a year now to uh, buy coal from Montana and North Dakota, we're paying loggers for waste wood. We could do that all over the state in the agricultural regions, burning waste products to fuel uh, the, the plants that provide the electricity for the metro area. And those are some of the ideas that I've had and that I'd continue to have as governor. Uh, I went to Governor Palente last session to talk to him about the Ford Motor Plant closing down the Ranger plant. Say, Governor, you know, you supported legislation that mandated that by 2020 we're going to have 25 percent of our electricity be renewable. Why don't we mandate that by 2020 we're going to have 50 percent of our truck fleet for our cities mm -hmm. and counties and state of Minnesota be electric trucks and we can work with Ford and make them right here, make them for the whole country and keep those jobs down there uh, in St. Paul. Tom, uh, everybody running for governor is, has a vision for the state. What's yours? My vision for Minnesota is a place where anybody that wants to go on and better themselves, get a good higher education, whether it's in a technical program, whether it's learn how to operate a piece of machinery or being a uh, brain surgeon, where that opportunity is given to them. You know, my uh, parents as first generation Americans had the opportunity of getting a good education. And, and that's what I think pushed our state forward. That's the reason why we have all those Fortune 500 companies here. And that's the way we're going to keep them here and get new ones to come with an educated workforce.